Welcome everyone to Talia Tuesday on the Blueprint Podcast, where we dive deep into the realms of confidence and assertiveness with our co-host, Talia Bombola. As a licensed marriage and family therapist and specialist in confidence and assertiveness, Talia brings a wealth of expertise and insights to our discussions. Join us each Tuesday as we explore practical strategies, personal anecdotes, and empowering advice to help you cultivate the confidence and assertiveness you need to thrive in all aspects of life. Get ready to unlock your full potential and build the life you desire with Talia and Jason as your guides. This is a question that pops up in the comment section every now and again. What is limerence and what does it look like with someone who has an avoidant attachment? So first question for the limerence piece. Limerence is a state of a state of being emotional, mental or otherwise where you become obsessed. It's usually one sided but sometimes it's two-sided when you're in the beginning stages of a relationship and you have this obsession and this infatuation with usually the idea of the person, not the person necessarily themselves. So there's usually three phases that a person works through. Like I mentioned, infatuation is the first phase. You recognizing all their positive qualities. I like to joke with my clients, you think the sun shines out there, you know what, and the world revolves around them and you're fascinated by them and they can do no wrong. You pedestalize them. Then there's crystallization That's when we notice the lack of sleep, the obsessive thoughts, the anxious thoughts, and the ecstasy of just being near them or thinking about them. You have this high that comes out. And then the last phase is usually the deterioration, which is when the idealization of that object in analysis, um, not that we're calling a person an object, but it's the object of your limerence, it wears off. And so do the intensity of the feelings. And that usually happens about 18 to 24 months into a relationship. And then you decide if you want to make it a more long-term committed relationship, if that even gets that far. Some relationships do not get to that committed stage because they break off around six to eight months. Around 15 months is usually another marker we see um, because women are like, if you haven't turned us into a wife by then, or if we haven't turned a boyfriend into a husband, it's expired. Like the pumpkin hour has happened. We're done. And then 18 to 24 months, the masks have fallen off. You generally know who that person is. Then you make the decision once the hormones have leveled out, like, can I be with this person long-term if that's what you're really wanting in a relationship? So limerence is something that anybody can feel. It doesn't mean that everybody will have that infatuation in the beginning and what it looks like with an avoidant is usually when the person is anxious, they especially pedestalize the avoidant person because there's in the gap between what you know about them and what you're fantasizing them to be is all that space to paint the picture of what you think your life could be like. It's the Homer Simpson meme where the person's walking down the stairs in the wedding gown after one date and they're like, oh, but they are all these things. And then as a therapist, I'm like, well, who said that though? They're like, well, I just, I think I'm like, well, there's your first risk. (laughs) Don't think too much because you'll think your way into a fantasy that isn't real. Limerence with an avoidant looks like you build them up to be available when they're not. You build them up to be emotionally attuned when they might not be. You you misread that space they give you to share all about your feelings and your wants as them either reciprocating them specifically or the ability to reciprocate. And that's not necessarily the case. So there does have to be a realization that you might be pedestalizing the avoidant person because again, that gap gives you so much space to fantasize about what you wish they could be. Yeah. And that fantasy and that idealization feels so good Mm -hmm. to the anxious attacher because it's like that dream is just, it's about to come true. You're right on the cusp of it. And then when it doesn't happen, that's when everything tends to fall apart. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so is there there devaluing that comes along with that when the other person doesn't live up to the idealized version? Like if the person's anxious and they're the avoidant is their limerent object. Yeah. I would Mm -hmm. say it's not like the devaluation discard phase that people, I roll my eyes because it's um, so overdiagnosed by unqualified people on social media for narcissistic personality disorder. And so I'm not talking about that kind of devaluating. No, 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 no. Like yeah. you're so upset off, and yes. disappointed that now well, I, I have to make you bad. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. in object relations theory and psychoanalysis, we all have the ability to uh, see ourselves. We don't always 
technically we have the ability to see ourselves as both good and bad parts, good and bad object. And I'm not calling people objects, but that's the, the theory. Yeah. So when you view somebody entirely as a good object and you're still in that phase and they do something bad object, you're like, mm, you write it off. You're like, no, they couldn't possibly have meant it for that reason. They did it for this. So you keep valuing and pedestalizing them because you, you, if you had to see them as a bad object, then you'd have to face your own bad object parts, which is half the reason why relationships are so uh, enamoring because they allow us to escape our own stuff that we haven't learned how to sit with yet. So if this person is consistently the good object and I can only focus on them, it avoids my pain and owies and my bad parts. And then when they do enough, right, and the hormone shift starts to happen, they naturally will fall off the pedestal or you find out too much. You can't possibly keep them on a pedestal because you'd be selling yourself short and you know it, that they become a bad object and it's the splitting, right? It's like, they're good. They're bad. They're all good. They're all bad. They, once they shift into an entirely bad object in your mind, it's very difficult for committed love to follow mainly because you've created this monster version of them that you can't unsee. And so your brain is like, well, we have to keep ourselves safe from that person by thinking they're the worst person in the world. How many comments do you see all over Instagram? You probably see a ton because your content is entirely geared towards this. They're the worst. They're the this. It's like, you're just saying that to make yourself feel better. Like all of this is based on a fantasy you had of this person. You're now saying the best person in the world two months ago is the worst person ever. Like that's not realistic. Like it's all delusion. So they do become a bad object and the person can't value them anymore as the pedestalized object because it's too painful. So they technically, I guess, would be like taken off and then they find a new object to pop up there. Oh, this person will be different. Not unless you've gone to therapy and done the inner work. You're just going to project yeah. onto the next person. Then that pattern continues. Yeah. I will say, though, people are coming around to my content. That is true. And they've, I'm they've, glad they've yeah. started reading the captions and rec recognizing that you got to go beyond the meme. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to feel a lot of feelings you don't want to feel. Mm hmm. And then yeah. just rage vomit into the comment section. <laughs> yeah. It, it's getting less and less. That's it's been good. good. Yeah. Good. I will say a big part of that whole experience of limerence ultimately becomes you being the perpetrator and breaking your own heart in yeah. that process. Mm -hmm. And so people often get confused when I say, well, what do you mean you're breaking your own heart? Well, this is exactly what we're talking about when you have this massive expectation of the way things are going to be and the way that they're going to happen. And 10 months from now, this is going to happen. And we're going to do this thing and it's going to be amazing. And you're planning all these things in advance because you already pre-qualified this person before you even started dating them because you swiped right and they looked amazing and everything was perfect and it was wonderful. And it just fits into this, this wonderful and amazing story that nobody could ever truly live up to. Correct. And, and then you hit that point of, you know, that fantasy starts to fall away after that 12, 18 months, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, and then you're left disappointed. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately that's a lot of what's happening in the comments section a lot of the times, uh, because people have idealized that person. They're not ready to give up that story yet, even though you're no longer together, you don't see each other, you mm -hmm. don't talk, you don't talk to each other. And it's been months to years and you're still holding on to a particular story. So what would you tell somebody who's still holding on to that story? Can I be brutally honest? Yeah, I mean, yes. It's not, it's not mean to the person. It just dawned on me. If you are struggling with that story, truly the best thing that you can do for yourself is go to therapy and work on your relationship with your parents. I know it's going to sound weird because it's like, but my parents have nothing to do with who I date. <laughs> you thought they have everything to do with it because they set the template. Even if you don't have any contact with them, even if you think you have a great relationship, you need to go in and analyze that first template you had for love because in some ways it's seeping out into your romantic relationship. And maybe this stems from you wish your parent were more available and they worked all the time growing up and you just hoped one day they'd get to the driveway by 5 30 PM. And that one day never came. And now that's being somehow sublimated or interjected out into this new relationship or this relationship where you want them to be on time for a date for once, like really doing the deep, work and understanding where this pattern came from it usually comes from our parents or some childhood relationship we saw as a model and we're like that that's what i want and that's what we've kind of strung our hearts along 
for our whole lives. And when it doesn't happen, and naturally people are fallible and human, they fall short. Yeah. And if we haven't learned to tolerate our own family's shortcomings, it's going to be incredibly difficult to tolerate, meaning to interact with and still have respect for, not put up with. It's a different meaning. It is going to be incredibly difficult for you to tolerate when the human being, the mortal human being who is fallible, who you are in a relationship with, makes a mistake or isn't this perfect vision that you've created. That's your work to do. And again, I would recommend maybe it's not brutally honest. It's just like uncomfortably honest is probably a better, that's my brand. Uncomfortably honest. Yeah. yeah. You have to look at what your relationship was like between your parents romantically as an adult and also what they were like with you and what hopes and dreams did you have that never really came true that you might be trying to get that need met indirectly in your romantic relationships. I would say go to therapy and work on your family stuff. And that's coming from a therapist and nothing we give here is medical advice. So no, so take, do with that what you will. I'm not liable, but that's what I would recommend off script. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning into today's episode of Talia Tuesday on the Blueprint Podcast with Talia Bombola. Remember, building confidence, self-love, and assertiveness is a journey, and each step you take brings you closer to your goals. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast for more insightful conversations and practical tips to support your personal growth, and head over to my stand store to sign up for the 21-Day Self-Love Challenge on sale now, and you can also drop a question for Talia and I for the podcast. Until next time, keep embracing your strengths asserting your boundaries and living authentically. Take care and we'll see you next Tuesday on the Blueprint Podcast.